I mean, really, you always put so much love into every detail of this conference. It, it has such a great vibe, and I'm really proud that you think I'm worthy to speak here. Because, so, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot to you, because this was what I saw so far was awesome. So, yes. <clears throat> so, okay, the time is running, so I should not spend too much time on the introduction, but my talk is called Machina Mac Imaginarium. Uh, I'm Quasimondo on Twitter, so you already realize I love making up weird names, and uh, yes, there will be a few more made up words during this talk. And this is about, well, the subtitle is A Journey into Artificial Creativity. And even if you're not in my filter bubble, uh, you might have noticed over the past year or two years that kind of the headlines were AI solves this or uh, machine learning is better at humans at that becomes more and more frequent. So you might be wondering or worrying kind of what will they become better at next? Uh, will I still be uh, have a job in five years? I mean, I will not be able to answer this, but so the idea is to show you a few things I am doing with machine learning, deep learning. I don't even like the term AI so much. I don't think we have reached AI yet, but it sounds good. So yes, I will just show you a few things and try to answer the question if machines can be creative. Um, but let me rephrase that question first a little bit uh, and ask, can humans be creative? Usually I answer that question, but in Aspen's talk this morning, uh, I saw this Bobby McFerrin video and I found, oh, that's a total fit. So. Uh, I hope you're not too tired, but we actually try this now. Yeah, I, I, I guess you heard that. Like it goes like I go like, bam, 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 and you have to sing with me. Okay, so please, so, bam, 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 bam. So, okay, it worked actually, yes, because uh, that's the point, right? Yes, we are very creative, but uh, our creativity is somehow limited because uh, what we are really good at is kind of making connections and extrapolating, but once we are end up in a space where the rules are not really sure, we don't really know kind of what's next. And actually, so over 100 years ago, uh, Jerome K. Jerome, one of my favorite authors, had actually realized that, that human thought is incapable of originality. No man ever yet invented a new thing, only some variation or extension of an old thing. And I think we had heard that before in Jeremy's talk before. Yes, uh, what we think is creativity is really just putting together, like making connections between things that we have already seen or other people have been invented before us. So. We can transfer a certain concept from something we already know onto something else, but we are totally incapable of inventing something from scratch. And so uh, the question is kind of, oh yeah, well, good example, like uh, a selfie stick, we had that scene before. Yes, you, all you need is a camera, a stick, a hand, and social media, and you have something that appears new, but everything is made out of parts that have already been around. And, well, actually that's a good thing, and uh, in a way that's how I deal with creativity. I think there's no useless knowledge. In a way you try, you have to absorb as much knowledge as you can, and because you never know what kind of connection you can make from that. So, uh, machines can of course help us also with this approach. Uh, I mean, they're really good in trying all kinds of connections. So an early experiment of mine called Ernst, uh, based on Max Ernst, it was able to generate me collages. So I just give it this set of elements, and then, of course, the machine can go infinitely through variations of the theme, stick it together, and I'll just have to sit back and select the ones I find interesting or aesthetic or novel. Um, but, of course, while well, the machine in this case is just a tool, I still have to make the decisions. Oh, so the thing is, like, human creativity is kind of, we always just building on top of what other people have built before. So, well, now come in the machines. And the question is, can they kind of like, how can they help us or can they surpass us in this process? And the other question is like, who is the author when the machine does something? Um, is it like, uh, because 
eventually, uh, is it cheating if the machine just simply looks at what we have done and then kind of makes its own new creations from that, or does it have to start from scratch? So I made this kind of little illustration, or based on these English children's books, which I tried to kind of paraphrase the problem. So Peter sees the computer, but the machine only creates what humans have taught it to, says Peter. So do you, says mummy. And that's what I mean is kind of, well, why should for the machines be there different rules than for, for humans? So we can only build on what other humans have done before. So, well, I guess it's a good start if the machines can, are allowed to do that too and they don't have to start from scratch. And that is kind of my approach. I'm trying to kind of train my machines to learn what have humans have done before us or already done, what humans find interesting, entertaining, uh, unusual, and well, then extrapolate, uh, find empty spaces and such. So yes, the tool to help us with kind of dealing with these complex things like human creations is called deep learning. And well, pretty much deep learning was invented to turn cats into data. <laughs> and uh, well, the way it does it is actually so, well, it's not true. It turns images of cats into data. And if you look at a I pixel image in a computer, it is already data. And uh, because every single pixel has already five pieces of information, it's the X, Y coordinate and the RGB value. The only problem is it's way too much information. So, well, it's way too redundant. It has so much information that we don't need. So in pretty much what these kind of what deep learning does is remove the air between the pixels and try to kind of, kind of condense down the information. And one of the tools used for that is a so-called convolutional neural network. And you might have seen these uh, kind of diagrams. Well, in the beginning, you throw in an image of a cat and that cat goes through a, a series of so-called convolutional layers, which step by step reduce the information within the image. So in the end, it can tell you, yes, I see a cat in this image. Uh, inside, there's actually, people think it's a black box, we don't know what's going on there, but it's actually bitmaps all the way down if you're dealing with images. So, and you can see in the early layers where the cat goes in, it's still, well, you, it looks like Photoshop filters, these classical ones, and that's what it is. It's really like blur and uh, sharpened kernels, only the machine learns different ones. The deeper you go down into that network, the more abstract the information gets. So at the end, it recognizes uh, maybe something like, oh, this is fur, this is uh, an edge, and then deeper down, it combines certain things that it recognized, and maybe then it says, this is an eye, and that is an eye, and this is a nose, so in the next layer it says, oh, it's a face. And that's all the magic. Uh, also, there are certain kind of phases inside this network. So the first layers are really dealing with superficial stuff, and we call that usually the style. It's really like gradients, uh, textures, uh, everything that is just on the surface. Deeper down, the, apps, the concepts become more abstract in a way. Well, eyes, nose, uh, something, wheels, and Almost at the end, that is where it gets really interesting because it creates something, so -called, a so-called feature vector, which in practice is really just a series of numbers. And the amount of numbers tells us how many dimensions it has. So sometimes it's, uh, it turns a cat into 128 numbers, sometimes into 1,024 numbers. But these feature vectors are really, really special because what they actually are, are kind of like an address, a unique address of any object it sees in this multidimensional space. And of course, we cannot imagine multidimensional spaces, but uh, we have tools to visualize them. And one is called TISNI, and you will hear that later on. And what it does is it projects this multidimensional space down into 2D so we can see it. What happens there is that things that look similar, they end up in that space uh, in similar areas. And that means that most of the cats will end up at a certain spot there. And the dogs might be somewhere else. But since it's multidimensional, it's not that easy because uh, there might be other cats living in other areas. Maybe some are drawn, maybe some are photos. Um, but 
the nice thing is really you can start calculating in this space. And uh, so you actually turn something abstract like a cat into a mathematical concept, and that allows you to do all kind of uh, extrapolations from there. Um, the way I imagine these multidimensional spaces is really like a laundry machine, because what happens if you put your laundry into the machine and you pull it out again, kind of everything gets twisted and, uh, I don't know, the sock winds around the jeans and, I don't know, a scarf is kind of uh, in the pocket of something else, so everything is intertwined and twisted, but, I mean, in the end, the manifold of the sock, or everything that is a sock, is still contained within, it is within itself. And so, well, we as humans, we can pick the sock and we know, yes, this is the sock manifold. And the machine pretty much does the same. So you have all these things where cats fly around in this weird twisted space, and all the machine does is try to untwist this space so it can make easy predictions on like uh, distinguishing like cats from dogs, but in the end, it's just just kind of a mathematical transformation of that space. So I already mentioned it because we have a hard time dealing with uh, more than three dimensions. There are really nice tools to help us in getting kind of a picture of what's going on in our data. And one is called TISNI, which means T Stochastic Neighbor Embedding, and all the cool kids use it now. I'm pretty sure I don't know who has used TISNI. Uh, who's doing data visualization? Yes, okay, uh, very good. Okay, so you know it. So it's a really nice tool. <laughs> but uh, you, uh, whenever you deal with some data, you should just throw your data at it and uh, do it because Start again. So what it does is you give it a lot of image data, for example, which has been run through a classifier, and it neatly sorts it out to you into thematic clusters. You don't even have to think about it. So this is stuff uh, from the British Library collection where they had one million unlabeled images, and uh, I tried to sort them out in a way by, in a way, starting small, uh, trying to separate things that I recognize from others, and of course, using a tool like this, I don't have to do it manually. I just have to find a few examples, and then I can start sorting through this stuff. And one thing you see, well, you saw, was that this clusters all kind of uglily together. So if you really want to have a clear picture, what you want is, well, have it laid out in a beautiful, maybe a, a grid. So here's an example, like a, a record covers kind of as they came out of Tisney, and this is then how a tool I wrote called Rastafari is sorting all this thing out into something that can then be nicely layouted, and of course gives you also even a better and clearer picture, like how your data, what's in your data, what is similar, what belongs together. And uh, so that Rastafari is on, on GitHub, and it has quite a kind of nice functionalities, and well, I also just like the way it animates because it feels very organic. Uh, in a way, how because the tricky part is so everything that has been clumped together in the original version should still stay together, and there are some that is actually a tricky mathematical thing. And I had this little fight with uh, Carl McDonald, uh, who is faster in making this nice. So yes, the nice thing about Rastafari is that you can transform any kind of cloud in any other cloud. So. Uh, for I don't know what purposes, but I, I liked it that it's, it's so versatile. So I was already talking about it. So the first kind of usefulness of using these neural networks is that concept of similarity. So you can, if you have something, you can find more things of, of that same thing. And that is actually becoming quite important later on. But so yes, it helps you get a clear picture at how your data is structured, what is actually found in there. So one thing I'm doing is simply just finding things, uh, starting these collections. So this is again from the British Library. I'm not really particularly interested in fossils, but once you start digging through a million images and you say, oh, well, yeah, this is the third fossil that can buy, so how about I start a collection? And then you pick them all out, and then you, well, you, s you start appreciating the, the little beauty in there. Or we saw kind of these rock tools before. Yes, what's more boring than a rock? But then when you start collecting them, you just add a little bit of happiness whenever you come across it. And I mean, there went so much work into people, like into creating these, uh, well, these etchings, uh, and well, usually they just get discarded. You know, nobody's interested. But so pulling this out, maybe somebody could pre-appreciate the beauty that is actually in these. 
or these are 36 uh, anonymous profiles, just some, again, something you usually just walk by, but once you collect it in mass, well, I find those quite aesthetic. Or 16 very sad girls. So you find these stories, you ask questions, why are there so many sad girls in these, uh, in these uh, actually, pre-movie, so these were from, uh, what was it called? Uh, thrilling stories for the masses. So it was kind of mass media, cheap stories, and yes, they were all kind of sad. Well, there's also the series of Desperate Men, which are usually going like, ooh, I'm ruined, or uh, something like that. So it's, it's nice, you go through all this old material that has been produced before, and you get some inspiration and some ideas what to do with it. Uh, you can also, well, and that's the interesting part, so, of course, the goal is that uh, eventually the machine understands kind of what, how humans see the world and gets a similar concept of that. So this was an experiment I did in a workshop in Lausanne last year with some students. I asked them to bring 20 everyday objects from home, and then we had them all photographed and run them through a computer recognition, like the, through one of those convolutional neural networks, and had the machine kind of sort them out thematically. Like, we just asked them, like, sort them visually, and this is kind of the layout it created. And there are some nice details because it actually put all the balls, everything round and, and ball C together. Uh, the everything like con computer consoles, cassettes, everything plastic was uh, just by looking at the, at the visual shape. It ordered them all together. Uh, I really like the one with uh, the crucifix and the, the brush. So both are made of wood, I guess. Uh, or thin things, uh, but this is my favorite. So you see that assortment of gloves up there, and then you see the Super Mario doll, and of course it has the white gloves, but there's also the other white gloves. So there is something, some understanding, or at least something where we can find familiarity. There. So the machine has something like uh, similar ideas about the, the, how the world stuck together like we. And yes, then we of course did something like a, a, a real installation, which is sometimes is difficult because some of the objects were bigger than the others. But and the students made some interactive things on top of it, where we could light them, highlight them, do searches, all these kind of things. Uh, the similarity can also be done with movies, and I always like, as you saw, I like collecting th similar things. So I applied the same thing on movie scenes, on old movies, and. Uh, the way it works, I give it a simple example, or two or three examples. In this case, hands. I showed just like scenes where there's a single hand doing something. And then have the machine find me everything else where, where the scene is similar, where I just get to see hands. So, this is a collection of hands. completed the first step in the process. Well, so uh, I like it because in a way, you know, maybe uh, Christian McClay has this famous piece called uh, the, the Clock, which is a 24-hour installation of movies that always show a clock in some place. So, I mean, so the idea is not new again, but uh, I really like that it's possible now. I don't have to manually look through the entire movies, but I just give examples and the machine retrieves them for me. I mean, there might be actual useful things that are not so just abstract and artistic. Um, yeah, so doing all this stuff with the British Library and uh, kind of showing that I am able to do something with lots of data and neural networks once got me this email coming from, well, the email that people always hope for, that from the Google Arts and Culture in Paris, and they asked me if I would like to have a residency there. And of course, I didn't hesitate at all and proposed them, like, the, the Google Culture Institute has more than 7 million cultural artifacts in their database, like paintings, sculptures, everything, and a lot of metadata. And so my task is to find interesting new ways to make discoveries in this data or, well, approach art in a, from, this, from this angle of saying, like, well, are there, like, can we show people something? Can we interest people in, uh, 
in, in seeing more art in a way or finding interesting things in art that they don't know about. So I propose this project called X degrees of separation and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the concept of six degrees of separation where in a way every human is connected to every other human on the planet by a maximum of six steps. So I know somebody who knows somebody and in the end you know a, I don't know, somebody who fries noodles in Shanghai. And so I've asked the question, can you do the same with artworks? So can you find like connections between eight, an artwork A and an artwork B or some artifact and then find intermediate artworks that kind of, well, give you a transition uh, in some what way ever. So of course you could think I just take uh, the metadata. So how are two artworks related? Maybe they are painted by the same artist or they were created in the same time or they are from the same movement. But I wanted to again have the machine do the decision. So I was using the same algorithm that drives uh, the Google image search where you, you know that one where you drag an image onto the, onto the search box and then it gives you everything that looks similar. And, well, the lucky position I was in, I get that feature vector I was talking about. So, well, every image gets turned into this, exactly this uh, 128 numbers. And then I can start building, well, almost like a roadmap. So everything has its place and then it, I really treat it like if it was, uh, well, I want to travel from Dusseldorf to Berlin and then I take the Autobahn and in this case it's the links between the artworks. So here are a few examples. So how do you get from this portrait on the left to this sculpture on the right? And well, it only looks at the visual similarities and I pretty clearly you can see that there are visual similarities. The interesting part is some of them are, because it's a multi-dimensional similarity, it's, it goes these interesting pathways. So sometimes, it, yes, it's a face, or sometimes it's just uh, the way a, a certain shape is formed. But I find the, well, the, the reason I like these is because, yes, along the way, like you might know the beginning and the end, because, well, everybody, when you go to a museum, you go to your favorite artists. But in between, there are so many other interesting things to discover, and there's simply no chance you will ever know about them. But maybe if you go along this path, there's a chance for serendipity, where, well, where in, in the middle, you might actually discover something that you, you really like. So yes, it works with any kind of visual. And or here again, sculpture to painting. And well, I find these quite compelling and, and uh, surprising. And one more. And yes, there's an online version too, but I will not show it to you now. But yes, if you want to go there, you can play around it with your, uh, yourself and, uh, and hopefully make some interesting discoveries. Okay. So far, I was just talking about similarity, but the, if you reimagine this kind of landscape or map that was created by every, every object that was known, it looked almost like, a, like continents and everything. So because we can do mathematics in there, that is where you could ask, okay, but what is actually happening in, well, in the empty spaces? And, or kind of if I know the similarity between A and B and I have a value, so I, I can do certain measures. And one idea is that when I look at an image and look at every other image I know, I can measure the distance between them. And it's really like if it looks much <coughs> dissimilar than what I have known before, well, it, it's new, it's novel. So I built this bot, it lives on Twitter, it's called The Noveltist, which actually follows right now, I think, uh, over a thousand uh, t accounts that tweet a lot of images and uh, it looks at them and remembers every single one of them and only retweets the ones that look sufficiently different to what it has seen before. Uh, it does not make any sense, but in a way I create this big collection of images that, well, somehow are standing out or I hope are standing out. So yes, uh, this is an example of what it has found novel. and. Uh, there's a little problem with it, and that's the general problem with neural networks, that 
the model I used has been trained, well, it's kind of this general model, which is looking for mobile phones and everything, but it also knows about 300 sorts of animals and puppies. And there is the danger. So the model is very specialized in puppies. So the difference between a dog and a cat or two dog races is much bigger than between a mobile phone and, uh, and a flower, because it has, like, its resolution in the puppy space is so much higher. So it finds puppies extremely novel and constantly retweets them. So, that, but it's kind of like a, a way to, well, hopefully discover something that uh, is, because, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I go through my Twitter feed, I get to see all the same stuff, like people, I mean, it's probably necessary, but people constantly post the same stuff, and I find that horribly boring, so this, you will definitely never show me the same things, and hopefully something new. And I've been using it for some, for like a generative piece where, which also, when you have generative art, in the end you have this uh, 10,000 balls of oatmeal problem, like you have this algorithm that generates art, but okay, if you look at a thousand of them, yes, they pretty much look all the same. So I was trying to figure out what's the, the, the potential range this, this algorithm of mine has. So I have it constantly create and the novelist only picks the ones that are looking sufficiently different to kind of all the rest. And then hopefully it gives me some parameters that tell me, okay, yes, this is an interesting space I could manually explore. Okay, uh, another part which is important is training, obviously, because if you don't want to take models that have been pre-trained for you, you have to train your own. And you might have heard that is usually dealing with a lot of images that you have to show the thing in the thousands, ten thousands, a hundred thousand. And when you train it, in a way, well, you have to show it the right stuff. So I built myself some tools to help me with that, and one, ah, yes, and... Uh, one example I was showing, going to show is, so there in the British Library collection, there are all these uh, decorative initials. I mean, typically, when you do character recognition, you deal with, uh, well, handwritten or typically, like, well-defined ones. But I was asking, can I train the machine to recognize all these crazy letter forms, all these difficult ones? And for that, I built me a little tool, which uses this classic method of swiping. So. The machine tells me, I think it's an A, and I say, left swipe, nope, and right swipe, yes, if it's correct. And that method, so you want to be super fast with it, and this allows me to go manually through a thousand or two thousand images in an hour, and very quickly make the model better and better. And so, because that is un unavoidable, eh, if you want to train it on your individual data, which I think is very important if you want to stay in control what the machine does. So yes, in the end, that worked totally fine. So these are some examples how what kind of A's it recognized. So even though they are totally different, because the machine has only been trained on letter forms, it has become really good at recognizing them. And it has become good like this, that it says, OK, I think it's in B. And I thought, no, it's a ruin. So, but it was insisting on it's a B. So I looked in the original scans where this image was found and actually the machine was right so <laughs> it is a B and so because that's the problem right like if everything you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail so this machine is seeing letters everywhere because it doesn't know anything else but letters so it creates all these nice like I give it any kind of set of images and it finds me with certain probability things that look like letters to it so I thought that's actually the interesting part so I started this collection of things it thinks are letters but are not so this is the I can, guess you can guess it's the A collection so everything the machine thinks looks like an A like an M a T and, oh, I skipped the one, yes. <laughs> I think I had some more T's in there. But yeah, so again, it's nice because it, it's, it's like a human inspiration works, right? In a way, the best stuff is when, when you, well, actually the, the have an, a random inspiration or you come across something somewhere else and suddenly realize how interesting that could fit into your current problem. Let's, but so far we had the similarity, we had kind of like novelty detection, but of course the what I wanted to show you is how to generate, how to create with these machines. And obviously that's possible too. And 
Well, because I like making up names, I, I have a, a title for this whole process because it's not really kind of, I'm not really a creator. Um, so I call it neurography because it's like photography in these virtual latent spaces, in these multidimensional spaces. So I, as an artist or, well, however you might call it, go into these spaces and look for interesting imagery that the neural network has generated. So I have to still select but the machine generates. Of course, I have control. Unlike a photographer, I can shape that space by training, by selecting what material I want. But eventually, I can just look around and, and pick what I like. So the first step is, for example, called neural portraits. And it's the idea to say, like, okay, if I train a model on a lot of faces, ah, it's uh, then... Uh, how does the machine actually perceive a human face? And what I'm using for this is this paper by uh, Nguyen A. I don't know. So uh, you can read it. I'm sorry, I can't. But I mean, because in the end, the heroes in this in this whole story are the scientists. I'm just like plucking the low-hanging fruits. So there are all these fantastic papers out there where I'm seeing something like this and say, oh, could this be used to for my purposes? So what this does is, after I've trained a network. I've, it, it feeds in pretty much like a random noise into the network and says, okay, what do you recognize? And then it says, okay, nothing, but maybe it, uh, at 1% chance for a dog. And then it changes the incoming noise more and more so that bar with the dog, if I want the dog, or in this case the face, becomes higher and higher. So it shapes that noise that I send in more and more in order to maximize the output for a certain category, in this case, faces. So I trained it on a lot of faces, and as you can see, yes, they are all white, because I don't know, I harvested them, so, it's, uh, so there is that personal bias, or in this case, laziness, that I just went through Tumblr and sc scraped, I don't know, uh, 100,000 faces, and... Uh, this is what the, the neural network then says it recognizes in a face. So yes, it doesn't need much. It's very creepy, but yes, it's just a few eyes, a big mouth, and some hair. So, but yes, definitely kind of a new way of, uh, of looking at humans. And yes, uh, it's, it's very easy to be creepy. And this is the big version when you scale it up, because there's this other issue we come later on is that these things are right now all in a rather low resolution, so it needs some tricks to get a bigger resolution. This looks actually quite happy. I think it more, looks more like a happy dog. Or this, um, but yes, there, we, we recognize some face in there, but definitely not uh, a, a true face. But that is where I think it gets interesting, because yes, if I wanted to create a face that looks like a face, I can use a 3D tool or something like that. So I'm more interested in finding these in-between spaces where, where it looks kind of weird or new to me. But what you can also do is you can take an untrained network, so one that is kind of coming out of the box. And usually these untrained networks are not empty, but they are trained just, they're filled with random numbers. So you have this cascade and all the weights that control these uh, convolutions are just random. So the question is what happens if I feed something in there and try to emphasize a random category? Will it just get me noise? No, it actually creates something like this, and it definitely has, well, the, it, it feels like abstract painting to me, and there are these sometimes things we think we recognize, or at least they are interesting compositions, and so, again, it, it's, it's a nice uh, inspirational tool, for maybe for color scheme, or even to, to print it out. And, uh, well, there's definitely something not human going on, or, but yeah, I don't know, I can't really describe it, but I find it kind of, yeah, it's in this weird space in between that I'm actually looking for. And a few more bigger ones. And um, you can also animate, because uh, this, guy, this space is continuous. So in this case, I'm going, flying through this multidimensional space in a way, and say, okay, highlight me a certain category. And this is then kind of what it looks like inside if I try to stay abstract and not get too concrete. As you can see, the resolution is really low, but, well, bear with me. Um, what you can also do is, when I saw this, is, well, okay, well, it looks like 
could be definitely used for a music video or so. And uh, so I, I thought, okay, but I want the machine to entirely be able to create the video. I don't want to give any, any kind of uh, advance. Like, I want to see what happens uh, if I just try to connect the music to the, to the visual by, again, treating the, the parts of the music the same way I treat the images. So I order the frequencies and songs by, by, and, and sound snippets by similarity. And if something sounds similar, it should end up in a similar space in this abstract multidimensional space. So it starts somewhere and then it says, okay, uh, this sounds different to what I know, so move to a random position. But then later on in the song, it says, oh, uh, this sounds like something I've heard before, so let's go back there. So let's have a quick, I don't play the entire video. And excuse me for the, for the techno. I have to talk with you because I think you have to make me some better music. I cut this short because uh, I see I, my time is running out. Uh, so we'll just keep in mind you can see the rest on, on YouTube if you, if you like this kind of music. And it, it goes on, but there are some interesting elements where you really see that, yes, it is kind of synced to the music. Uh, but abstract is not everybody's, uh, well, cup of tea. So I thought, like, I, how do I get human elements into my art? And uh, how do I harvest like human, like uh, something that is in the world. So I thought, well, to get human elements in there, we are interested in humans, so I need to have something like uh, human poses. So where do I find human poses? In photos. And there is, uh, again, neural networks that you can give a photo, and what it will give you back is kind of the a stick figure of how it, uh, well, how it believes a human is standing there. And after harvesting about 100,000 of different poses, I can interpolate between them. Uh, so this animation that you see is actually not from a video. It's really just going through, like, randomly jumping between poses it had found in totally different photos and uh, adding a little bit of physics or momentum. Uh, but so. N nobody ever moved like that, but I saw this kind of like there was this little phase where it looks like doing this, yes, like usually ah, I think this, yes, so like how I usually dance. I thought, oh, okay, how about if I take this pose and connect it to that same engine I used before with the music? So let's make the puppets dance. Again, so it's not video, it's, it's just random poses it makes up. I will cut it short, you can find it on, uh, on YouTube, but uh, so this is nice, right? So I can have something dancing without even having a real person and well, let's see where we go with that. Because this is now actually getting very interesting. This is, you have to remember these four, three letters, GUN, because this is kind of what everybody's using now. It's called Generative Adversary Network and it's, it's magic. Um, because it's actually not one, but it's the principle is you have two neural networks. One is trying to be a forger. It tries to generate images. It tries to be really good. Let's say it tries to be really good at faking Picasso paintings. So all it does is it, well, it, it generates a painting and says, this is a Picasso. Then you have a second neural network, which is the critique or kind of the detective. It tries to catch the, the first neural network cheating. So it knows about Picasso paintings and it looks at it and says, no, 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 that's, uh, that's definitely not one. 
And well, but what happens is, so whenever it tells the, well, the, 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 the forger that it did a mistake, the forger learns from its mistakes. So at some point, suddenly the forger gets better and tricks the critic into believing it has created a real Picasso. But of course then, because we have the control, the, the, the critique learns how to get better in distinguishing these little differences that make it. And in this process, they continuously getting better and better in, well, whatever you try to train it on. And one famous example, or famous at least in my circles, <laughs> its example is, is this a model called Pix to Pix. And it's pretty brilliant because it's super intuitive. Uh, what you do is you give it one image, uh, which is kind of, well, telling it, this is what I will give you, and then you give it another image and says, this is what I want you for me to create. And it's really two bitmaps, and you can be super creative in about what kind of combinations you give it. You just have to give it a lot of examples. And so you can see, I don't know, down here, you train it on drawings of handbags, and then it, try, it generates your handbags. But Scientists just kind of sometimes not don't have the right feel, right? Because like who wants drawings of handbags? So how it got really popular, and I think you have seen that one, is that uh, edges to cats. And because yes, that immediately kind of got it through the roof. And when that came out, I was like, why didn't I think of it? Because of course I had been playing around with it before. So, but I thought like, okay, I try something else. So. You know that classic example, you have something blurry like in a movie and uh, then they say, oh, can you enhance that? And then you suddenly see the face of the whatever culprit, murderer or something. So I thought, can the machine do that? If I give it a very blurry example of an image and the original, will it eventually be able to reconstruct the original if I just give it a blurry image? And this is what I'm getting. So on the left, this is my input. And on the right, this is what the machine imagines. And this is actually interesting because, well, as you can see, a lot of information has been lost in the left image. And the machine has to make up all the details. And at that, at that point, it actually has to get creative in a way. And whilst this is not like a photo, I really like this, this look and the, and the abstraction of it. So if you have kind of coarser details, you actually can almost get back to the original image. But yes, uh, there's. Again, we're a little bit in creepy land, so it's not really an enhancement, but well, I like the artifacts and things that are going on there. So instead of calling it enhancement, I call this technique called now transhancement, because in a way it tries to enhance it, but also transforms it. So, well, if you give it regular photos, you get these kind of things. And yes, it's creepy or sometimes quite interesting. If you have, again, not so fine details, you almost get back to the original, but yes, ooh. <laughs> and, but what I really like about it is the artifacts, the little details, because it generates kind of new, new types of artifacts I have not seen yet, because they are between painterly and digital, and well, I find those really attractive. Again, like a close-up, and so I, I, I feel I'm in a good space here. And, ooh, two minutes, so I have to go faster and faster, so a few more. Uh, well, obviously you can, because it can make up infinite detail, the deeper you zoom into something, it can always generate new detail. Yeah, you can do, kind of, the original eye was, I think, like 16 by 16 pixels, so it, it can make up all these details. Um, but, as you saw, I was using photos other photographers had shot, so I thought like, that's not a good idea because sometimes you might recognize them. So how about if I try to generate my own faces too? So in this case, I trained it on so-called face markers, which is uh, a, a technique used in face recognition where you get 68 markers, uh, just points, uh, where your mouth is, your nose, and uh, say, this is what I give you, and please give me... And then on the right, I gave it a lot of uh, portraits from the British Library collection. So the left sketch makes the entire right portrait. So, and none of these faces really exists in reality. So there is getting more interesting. So another video, like a bit slower. You see, well, you must like artifacts, but we get better at the artifacts. So there was young Elvis coming now, I think. <laughs> oh, no, there's some hipster again, but okay. So, or, but of course, now you are free because you, because you, uh, well, I can give it a few more eyes or can give add additional details. That's where it gets interesting. You've trained it on a certain rule set, but then nobody forbids you to 
break out of that rule set. So it, kno it knows I, so it can do more. Uh, this was all trained on, oh no, what do I skip? Okay, well let's, let's oops. Nope, let's have one more look, because this was trained on the British Library and all different faces, but I also trained it on a music video of just uh, Francois Hardy. And so this looks like a video, but it's all based again on just the face markers and it reinvents uh, her. So it makes just uh, every motion, every movement of the hand, every zoom is just generated by the machine by looking at five different music videos of her. So it's possible to not be totally creepy with it. And this is another one where this is actually, so you can see that the resolution is better, but well, okay, it looks like some face, uh, it could be used as a base. I think I don't want to go into creating realistic faces, just showing off. But again, like a, another face generated, then transformed through style transfer or style transfer, but all these original faces do not exist, so well, once you have this material, you can expand uh, in various directions. And I skip the face transfer now. Well, I play it quickly. But of course, this technique is dangerous because, yes, you can just create a sock puppet and make people say things they usually don't say. Yes, uh, quickly. I mean, but if we're uh, going to keep referring to so our press secretary in those types. But I skip this because I want to show the last thing and I go two minutes over. Um, so we have now the f the the faces that I can generate, and I, I showed you before how I harvested the poses from, from the world. And now, of course, I think like, okay, how do I get the poses into my images? So I thought I can train that same model also on uh, not just a single face, but I can just give it a stick figure, and then it will output me the rest of the painting. And this is, for example, things. So on the left top, you see the stick figure I feed in, and on the right, you see what the entire thing it has output for me. Or another one, stick figure on the left, something on the right. Of course, the results depend totally on what kind of training material I use, but this image is definitely not in my training set. And this is, I call solitary confinement, this series, because there's this weird thing based on my training set. I get this whole series of children in prison, or I don't know, it looks like somebody in a pajama uh, and some prison cell. Or I really like mostly the background texture and stuff. So, but, well, what I do, I just move through the space and, and have to pick, and that's the interesting part. So I'm not even sure if I'm the creator or more the curator. So, uh, but yeah, the machine offers me a lot of options. Again, like something, I don't know, Roman motorcycle courier, something more abstract body thing. Uh, or uh, it's getting creepy again. But yes, all of these are generated by the machine, and so I just make the pick. So, one more, and some paper brick cover, Pulp Fiction. I like this, looks like some race car driver, astronaut, in, and uh, especially that artifact on the left I really like. So, or you can go even less concrete and uh, overdrive the settings, go into weird poses, add some style transfer, and again, well, the, the space is so huge that, uh, well, it's more hard to decide where to go, but there's all these new fields to discover. Okay, so now you saw all this, and uh, well, you can decide yourself if you already have to be worried that you will be replaced by the machines anytime soon. I think it's an extremely powerful tool that is our hand, at our hands right now. I believe that especially if it comes to pop art or kind of mass market produced art, like the stuff you can buy at Bauhaus or all these other things, well, the machines definitely will be able to create something that looks like art. But eventually, well, they still do it for humans, so we still have a, a role as consumers at least, but if you enter the field now, you might still have a, uh, the possibility to shape it and uh, to, to steer it where it's going, because right now, well, we still have a lot of steering possibilities. And so I think you don't have to worry yet. Thank you very much.